The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Come, Holy Ghost, fill the hearts of thy faithful, and kindle in them the fire of thy love. Send forth thy spirit, and they shall be created, and thou shalt renew the face of the earth. Let us pray, O God, who didst instruct the hearts of thy faithful by the light of the Holy Ghost, grant us by that same spirit to be truly wise, and ever to rejoice in its consolation. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hello, and welcome to What Catholics Believe. This is a special brief report on a uh, statement of Francis that he just made, I believe it was just January 10th, in an interview on Italy's most popular primetime talk show. And uh, Francis there made the comment, I like to think of hell as empty. Now, Francis had previously spoken about the existence of hell in public speeches during the past 10 years. And uh, at one point, he even mentioned that uh, no one actually goes to hell if they are bad in life. They simply uh, are annihilated by God. Souls are annihilated by God if they're bad during life. And only those who are good and just will actually continue to exist, and they will go into the eternal life or everlasting life of heaven. The question is, uh, is this actually an expression of Catholic faith or is it something contrary to the Catholic faith? Well, the statement of Francis uh, made to Italian television uh, also carried his uh, admonition, well, I'm not saying this is a matter of dogma, he says, I'm just saying that this is my personal preference to think that hell is empty. That's what he said. That uh, not only are there no souls of human beings in hell, because he says they, they simply lapse into, into nothingness if they, when they die, if they're bad, but uh, he, he talks about hell itself being empty. And it is Catholic dogma that there is a hell, and yes, there are spirits in hell. It is Catholic dogma to that effect. It's, all, it's divine revelation. Uh, our Lord himself said in St. Matthew's Gospel, Enter ye into the, at the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there are who go in thereat. How narrow is the gate, and straight is the way that leadeth to life and few there are that find it. This is from St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7. Beware of false prophets who come to you in the clothing of sheep, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. It's interesting that our Lord would make this statement about the narrow way that leads to life and the broad way that leads to destruction. It says, few there are that go the narrow way to life, and many there are who follow the way to destruction. Now, Francis might interpret that as meaning, well, if they're going to destruction, then that would support his preference to think that they are annihilated rather than that they suffer an eternity in hell. But uh, actually, the church has described and explained exactly what our Lord means by these words without Francis, long before Francis came to be. The church actually pronounced on the subject of our Lord's meaning here. But it's also interesting that no sooner had our Lord say these words, said these words about the uh, narrow way that leads to life and the broad way that leads to hell, the few there are, relatively, who find their way to life and the many who take the broad path to destruction, then our Lord warns about false prophets because it might well be understood by us today that Francis is indeed one of those false prophets our Lord is warning us against, who misinterpret his words. Now, our Lord also is speaking 
in St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25, about the judgment. And he said that he will call the souls before him for the general judgment, the great last judgment at the conclusion of time. And he will say to those, the goats on his left hand, then he shall say to them, also that shall be on his left hand, this is St. Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire, which was prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me not to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me not to drink. Kind of interesting that this statement of our Lord actually comprises the, the actual corporal works of mercy, which are, one might say, Francis's main thrust, you know, providing this, the physical needs of others is Francis's, you might say, obsession, actually. But our Lord says that those who fail to give these things will be ordered by Christ to depart from him and to go into the everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. So Francis, again, seems to be directly contradicting the words of Christ himself. You know, sacred scripture tells us, our Lord himself tells us that the everlasting fire was created for the devil and his angels, the angels who followed him in his rebellion. So it's impossible to say, as a Catholic, as anyone who would be purport to be a Christian, <clears throat> that hell is empty, because we know that hell was created for the devil and his angels in any case. <clears throat> they certainly would not want to deny that Lucifer fell and angels followed him in his rebellion, and that hell created for them, received them, uh, or would they? Who knows what is the next thing to come out of the mouth of Francis. But still, these words of our Lord are very clear, uh, that the devil and his fallen angels are in hell because it was created precisely to receive them. And uh, there are those on earth who uh, are going to be joining the fallen angels there because they are wicked on earth, and there's no mention of them being annihilated rather than punished in hell. Now, the Catechism of the Council of Trent speaks very clearly about this matter. It says, um, the, the abodes that are mentioned under the uh, article of the Creed, our Lord descended into hell, uh, are not of the same nature. Um, for among them is that most loathsome and dark prison in which the souls of the damned are tormented with the unclean spirits in eternal and inextinguishable fire. This is directly from the Catechism of the Council of Trent, actually from the Council itself. Uh, I think this is, a, a chapter, it is a session six of the Council of Trent. This place is called Gehenna, the bottomless pit, and is hell strictly so-called. And so uh, if you look at the decrees of the Council of Trent, you come to session six and you'll find this statement made. It's very forthright. In fact, then if we turn to the Catechism of the Council of Trent and we go to the article of the creed, the seventh article of the creed, and that is, from thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. And uh, again, we find some very interesting statements in the Catechism of the Council of Trent that was first published by Pope St. Pius V in the year 1566. And uh, this is what the Catechism itself says. Uh, Turning next to those who shall stand on his left, he will pour out his justice upon them in these words. Depart from me, ye accursed ones, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels, as I just read from St. Matthew chapter 25. The first words, depart from me, express the heaviest punishment with which the wicked shall be visited, their eternal banishment from the sight of God, unrelieved by one consolatory hope of ever recovering so great a good. This punishment is called by theologians, the pain of loss. Because in hell, the wicked shall be deprived forever of the light of the vision of God. 
The words, ye cursed ones, which follow, increase unutterably their wretched and calamitous condition, if when banished from the divine presence, they were deemed worthy to receive some benediction, this would be to them a great source of consolation. But since they can expect nothing of this kind as an alleviation of their misery, the divine justice deservedly pursues them with every species of malediction once they have been banished. The next words, into everlasting fire, express another sort of punishment, which is called by theologians the pain of sense, because like lashes, stripes, or other more severe chastisements, among which fire, no doubt, no doubt, produces the most intense pain, it is felt through the organs of sense. When, moreover, we reflect that this torment is to be eternal, we can see at once that the punishment of the damned includes every kind of suffering. The concluding words, which was prepared for the devil and his angels, make this still more clear. For since nature has so provided that we feel miseries less when we have companions and sharers in them, who can, at least in some measure, assist us by their advice and kindness, what must be the horrible state of the damned, who in such calamities can never separate themselves from the companionship of most wicked demons? And yet, most justly shall this very sentence be pronounced by our Lord and Savior, and those sinners who neglected all the works of true mercy, who gave neither food to the hungry nor drink to the thirsty, who refused shelter to the stranger, clothing to the naked, and who would not visit the sick and the imprisoned. So this is what the Catechism of the Council of Trent says with regard to Article 7 of the Apostles' Creed. Uh, that pertains to the judgment of mankind by Jesus Christ, as portrayed in St. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 25. So it is clear that Francis's um, musings, his, his preference to think, is itself contrary to Catholic doctrine. But Francis, as already stated clearly, he rejects the very concept of doctrine. No wonder St. Pius X says that modernism is the synthesis of all the heresies, because it doesn't just deny one doctrine or another, it actually undermines the very concept of doctrine by changing the very understanding of what faith means. It gives a very different definition, an anti-Catholic, in fact, definition of faith. Francis certainly is a modernist, and one might say he is the modernist in chief. He is the quintessential modernist of our day, and uh, he rejects the Catholic understanding of faith, and therefore rejects the Catholic understanding of doctrine. Not just this doctrine or that doctrine, but all doctrine. In fact, Francis's guide is what he prefers to think. For him, that is the doctrine of the moment. Now, one might ask, uh, concerning this statement of the Catechism of the Council of Trent, how it is that a soul in hell can feel uh, a sense of pain when that sense must come through the bodily organs, the nervous system and so on. The body is left behind to decay here on earth and the soul itself goes to hell. So if the body does not accompany the soul and the soul is stripped of the body in, in hell, how can the body experience the pain of sense well, I think that uh, St. Thomas Aquinas gave us a very good answer to that about 850 years ago or so, when he, he said that in hell the souls are so united with the flame as though the flame itself were the body, as though the, the flames became, practically speaking, the body united with the soul. And this is a frightening thought to, to contemplate, that the flame itself would, as it were, be mainlined into the soul. The soul has to have the power, in fact, gives the power to the body to sense. And um, that, that power shoots directly into the soul itself. It's a horrible thought, certainly, but it uh, makes a great deal of sense, as it made sense to St. Thomas Aquinas 
uh, more than eight centuries ago, it actually does make a great deal of sense to us today how this is possible by our understanding of the human soul. Now, uh, Lucia, the, uh, the oldest of the three seers at Fatima, uh, talked about the vision of hell that was given to the children on July 13th, of 1917. Uh, she describes that the, the earth in front of them the earth before their feet opened up, and they were looking down into the abyss of hell. And um, she describes what she saw. She saw she spirits, as it were, enveloped in the flames and being thrown about, uh, one with the flames, um, and without equilibrium, without any control, as though they were totally engulfed in the flames. And uh, that would seem to lend, um, again, itself to the understanding that St. Thomas Aquinas had. Now, of course, Fatima is a private revelation. Uh, St. Thomas Aquinas is a theological opinion. And yet, nonetheless, these seems to coincide, seem to go, coincide very well with the Catholic understanding of the nature of the human soul. What does not coincide with the Catholic understanding of the nature of the human soul is Francis's understanding uh, that the human soul simply uh, will be annihilated if it has not been uh, motivated by mercy and the love for God and the love for fellow men. Uh, in fact, love for God isn't even necessary for Fran as far as Francis is concerned. He says that atheists can be saved because of their love for their fellow men. So that is the love that is, for him, essential to be saved. Otherwise, um, souls will be annihilated, he says. So in, in any case, that is not compatible with Catholic teaching. So please um, don't be deceived by the words of false prophets. I'll end with the uh, reading of that conclusion, the conclusion of the Council of Trent's Catechism concerning Article 8, Article 7 of the Apostles' Creed. And the, uh, the Catechism actually ends that consideration of Article 7, that he will come to judge the living and the dead, by telling us the importance of instruction on this article, the very article that Francis is calling into question, or at least imagining away. This is what the Council of Trent admonishes. These are thoughts which the pastor should very often bring to the attention of his people. For the truth which is contained in this article, that is to say about the judgment of Christ and the banishment of the condemned to the fires of hell, the truth contained in this article will, if accepted with faithful dispositions, be most powerful in bridling the evil inclinations of the heart and in withdrawing men from sin. Hence we read in Ecclesiasticus, In all thy works remember thy last end, and thou shalt never sin. Ecclesiasticus chapter 7, verse 40. And indeed, there is scarcely anyone so given over to vice as not to be recalled to virtue by the thought that he must one day render an account before an all-just judge, not only of all his words and actions, but even of his most secret thoughts, and must suffer punishment according to his deserts. On the other hand, the just man will be more and more encouraged to lead a good life. Even though his days be passed in poverty, ignominy, and suffering, he must be gladdened exceedingly when he looks forward to that day when, the conflicts of this wretched life being over, he shall be declared victorious in the hearing of all men, and shall be admitted into his heavenly country to be crowned with divine honors that shall never fade. It only remains, then, for the pastor to exhort the faithful to lead holy lives and practice every virtue that thus they may be enabled to look forward with confidence to the coming of that great day of the Lord, nay, as becomes children, even to desire it most fervently. <laughs> it is very fitting that we address this very issue uh, the day after our previous program, which raised the question of the fewness of the saved and those who are discouraged by that thought. <clears throat> the Council of Trent, in its catechism, is encouraging pastors to tell the Catholic people about the judgment 
and how real it is and how serious it is that our Lord Jesus Christ actually came for the very purpose of delivering us from the powers of hell. He came and he suffered as he did, even suffered on the cross, his human feelings being subject to what a soul would feel in abandonment of hell. That he subjected himself to that so that you and I would never have to know how that feels. And so the very idea that there is everlasting punishment in hell is one of the great motives of our Lord Jesus Christ, the great motive of the Father in sending his Son to, to re redeem us from that punishment. And if you take that away, you certainly, well, you want to rob our Lord himself of that loving motivation which moved him to suffer so greatly. You know, Francis does not do this. He does exactly the opposite of what the Catholic Church in her Catechism of the Council of Trent tells pastors to do. Francis wants to take that away. And we read in the Catechism of the Council of Trent that, that instructing the people about the, the judgment and the consequences of the judgment should inspire them to virtue. Well, this is exactly what Francis is not doing. He is not inspiring the Catholic people to virtue. Rather, he is actually encouraging them to sin by rewarding sin. He wants to give their Eucharist to those who are in the state and living in the state and continuing in the state of mortal sin, uh, who are living in adultery. He wants to give the Eucharist to them. And for those who die as enemies of God, he wants to simply annihilate them, make them go away. There's no punishment for them. Other than that, punishment that they wouldn't even be aware of because their thoughts perish with them. Um, so Francis actually has a not very serious problem of faith. And as a modernist, it's not simply that he calls into question or prefers to believe that there is no everlasting punishment in hell. But that reflects on his very concept of the human soul, which is contrary to Catholic teaching. It even reflects about his concept of our Lord Jesus Christ and his mission here as our Redeemer. Francis's concept is contrary to Catholic teaching. It even affects the very understanding Catholics have of God as just and merciful. Francis has a very, very different concept, a very contrary concept, even of God himself. <clears throat> and the consequences of that different understanding that Francis has going back to his very different notion of who God is, <clears throat> carries down through everything else. Every other article of the creed is affected by that because Francis is a, is a modernist. He is the modernist, the archetype of modernism today. And not only does he actually undermine faith by redefining it as modernists do, as merely an experience of the divine, a very subjective, personal, unique experience of the divine for each individual. Francis not only undermines the idea of Catholic faith, he completely destroys it. Francis is the destroyer of faith, and uh, he wants to actually produce a new concept of faith for his new church that he is founding, the Synodal Church, as he calls it. Now, there are very practical consequences to this, and I ask you to please ponder these things. Um, there are those who suggest that Francis really is the false prophet, not just a false prophet, but is the false prophet of the apocalypse. What does the false prophet do in the apocalypse? He actually has lamb's horns signifying some kind of ecclesiastical stat, status, and he calls men to worship the beast. And just recently, Francis has praised publicly the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab. He's praising a man who actually is guided as his, as his own personal guru, uh, Noel Yuval Harari, an atheist Jewish homosexual who condemns the idea of God, doesn't believe in the soul at all, and has just come out and said, the idea of human, human rights and human liberty is a complete 
complete fabrication. It's a complete myth. A man who is an avowed enemy of God is Klaus Schwab's uh, mentor. And uh, Francis praises Klaus Schwab before the world. What more could the false prophet of the apocalypse do in calling mankind to follow, adhere, accept the teachings of this anti-Christian and very likely anti-Christ. So please uh, take this very much to the thought here and uh, the, prom the, the practical outcome in your mind, I hope and pray, is going to be that you're going to not follow false prophets, that you're not going to follow false teachers who are contrary to Christ and contrary to the teachings of the Catholic Church, but that you will seek out true traditional Catholic priests who adhere to the true traditional Catholic faith in his, all of its teachings, in its integrity, and practice that, put it into practice in the traditional Mass of the Roman Rite, the traditional Latin Mass, and the traditional sacraments, and not let anyone take that away from you. It has just come to our attention, and I close with this, because it all ties together, that uh, across the river from us here in Cincinnati, uh, the uh, Nova Sordo, and I call it the New Order uh, traditional chapel over there, Our Lady of Lords, has been basically shut down by the New Order Bishop of Covington uh, for something that one of their clergymen said uh, in a sermon, and he has now banned them uh, from uh, having anything to do with the people over there who are coming to their their uh, indult. It used to be called the indult, then it went on the Samoan Pontificum. Anyway, they had, by the permission of the bishop previously, they had permission to adhere to the 1962 Latin liturgy and the Latin sacraments, the traditional sacraments, and, and so on. So this was, as far as the people who went there were concerned, a traditional Catholic chapel, a traditional Catholic church where they could go and attend the true Mass and receive the true sacraments. This has just been uh, crushed by the Novus Ordo Bishop across the river. And... Um, Sad to say, the people who went there and the clergy who led them had already acknowledged explicitly that they existed only by virtue of the permission of the local modernist bishop who had the power of life and death over them, spiritually. And uh, he chose now to use that power to annihilate them and uh, basically... Uh, forbid them access to the traditional mass and traditional sacraments. And they are going to go along with this. Of course, they've already acknowledged that he had the power to do so. And um, so what else can they do except to say, well, you know, we accepted your, your offer, but we never really believed that um, you have any really any control over this. And we're, we're just going to continue in spite of your prohibition They've already conceded his control. He's already, they've already conceded that control to him. And this, again, finally gets back to the fundamental issue. Do the modernists who adhere to the synthesis of all heresies and practice it in modernism, the new order, do they really have the power to uh, forbid Catholics from practicing the Catholic faith? For those of us in the Society of St. Pius V, we say no, they do not have the power. No one has that power to cancel Christ. No one has the power to annihilate faith and redefine it in a new way, in an anti-Catholic way. No one has the right to forbid the traditional mass, the traditional sacraments, and Catholics' right to receive them. No one has that right. And uh, we insist on that. And for those who go into this with the idea that we're going to beg them to allow us to have these things um, as long as they will, but as soon as they forbid it, we'll let them take it away from us and, uh, and we'll be 
uh, we'll be left without, uh, without the practice of faith. They are going to paint themselves into a corner. So I appeal to those who are involved in this now, trying to practice the traditional Catholic faith within the new order and subject to the new order hierarchy, that they're making a tragic error. And they need to realize that they do not need permission from modernists to be Catholics, to believe as Catholics, to live as Catholics. God bless you, and I, I wish you well, and pray for all of you. Please pray for me too.